Welcome to our very special LGBTI Holocaust gathering this afternoon. My name is Brandon and I'm so delighted to welcome each and every one of you here today, including those who have travelled from interstate. I know we have some people from Melbourne and some people from Canberra who have made it here today too. I also wish to welcome the member for Sydney, Mr Alex Greenwich. Thank you for joining us today. It is so moving and it's really so special to see such a diverse cross-section of our LGBT community here today, including some of our friends and our supporters. Allow me to also pay my respects to elders past and present, on whose land we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. At this point, can I please ask everyone to please turn their phones off or to silence, just so we don't disrupt the flow of this afternoon's proceedings. I also wish to pay thanks to the Sydney Jewish Museum who have supported today's gathering through the provision of this venue and through other logistical support. Without being a representative of this museum in any way, shape or form myself, I do hope that everyone here will have a chance to visit this museum more thoroughly, either today or at some other point in time, to engage more fully with the depth and the significance of the material, the history, the stories and the experience that is here and contained. The Holocaust was the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of approximately six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collabor collaborators. Holocaust is a, Greek, is a word of Greek origin, meaning sacrifice by fire. The Nazis, who came to power in Germany in January 1933, believed that the Germans were racially superior and that the Jews were deemed life unworthy of life. During the Holocaust, the Nazis also targeted other groups because of their perceived racial inferiority. The Roma and Sinti, the Gypsies, the Handicapped, and some of the Slavic peoples, including the Poles and the Russians, as well as, as, well as other groups too, were persecuted on political and behavioral grounds. These included the Communists, Socialists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Homosexuals. I would now like to ask all of those who can to please rise as I invite Alex Greenwich to light the memorial candle. This will be followed by a minute's silence and then the English reading of the Hebrew prayer, El Malera Chamin, God Full of Mercy by Wayne Green. I'd like this candle to acknowledge, honour and remember all those who lost their, their lives at the hands of the Nazis during World War II, to the individuals, families, partnerships, dreams and ambitions, to communities and cultures, to potential and to possibility, to all those who would, to all that was destroyed by hatred and racism, we honour all that was lost. We remember too the courageous souls who risked their lives to save others, and we cherish the lives and stories of those who survived. God, full of mercy, defender of widows and father of orphans, be not be silent or restrained regarding the blood which was spilled like water. Grant proper rest beneath the wings of your presence in the great heights of the holy and pure. Unite the brilliance of the heavens, give light and shine 
for the souls of multitudes of thousands, men, women, boys and girls, who were killed and slaughtered, and burnt and suffocated, and buried alive in the lands touched by the hand of the German oppressor and its followers, all of them holy and pure, may the Garden of Eden be their resting place. Therefore, may the Master of Mercy shelter them in the shelter of his wings for eternity, and bind their souls with the bond of life. God is their inheritance, and may they find peaceful repose in their resting place, and I must say, Amen. 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 <coughs> thank you, Alex, and thank you, Wayne. We are privileged to still be living amongst the survivors of the Holocaust courageous testimonies and personal accounts of loss and survival aid our cerebral or academic ability to understand or engage with this dark era of history. I am incredibly honoured to introduce one very special survivor, our guest of honour, Frederick Weisinger. Fred, now in his 80s, is a vivacious and intellectual man and the oldest member of our Jewish LGBTI community in Sydney. A resident of Paddington with his current partner, Fatoya, who is also with us here today, Fred is socially minded, apparently quite shy, and most certainly charming. Fred was eight years old when Hitler and the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, the commonly held start date of World War II. At the age of 11, he witnessed the Romanian and Nazi occupation of his hometown Chernovitz, a former German enclave of modern-day Ukraine, and he spent the subsequent formative years of his childhood in constant fear of death and uncertainty. Today marks Fred's first public telling of his wartime story. Fred, I am mindful that this moment might be overwhelming. It might conjure up some heavy emotions and some painful memories. We are all here today right by your side to support you and to be with you. So when you're ready, I invite you to share your story with us. impact 
from the Jewish world. The Torah scholars, in Jewish intellectual Galicia in Bukovina were known for their tolerance and openness towards modernity while being firmly rooted in Jewish tradition and learning. This thriving Jewish world was wiped out in one go. Now I can go back to me. The part at Bukovina was ceded to the Romanians after the First World War. It, it was a totally German Jewish, a German Yiddish speaking area. The city in itself had about 50,000 Jews plus other nationalities. The Germans, Poles, Swabian, from all over the German Empire, in the Austrian Empire, that lived there peaceful harmony. Until 1918, when this particular area was ceded to the Romanians. <coughs> The Romanian brought in law at a time that you should be able to speak Romanian in every shop. But you deal with a lot of people who didn't like Romanian, and they only talk German in business, and they had sides all over the place speak on the Romanian. But this was a start. They tried to transform something that wasn't into something they wanted. Right. Now you have a, a bit of an idea of what sort of a countryside, or what sort of a town it was. The town itself was a very modern town by, by modern standard of town, imperial towns. It had imperial and Austrian imperial buildings. Like the property is here, a large building that was my primary school, and where they had a, a, a theater that was a replica of the opera house in Zurich. And they had a, a variety, a Jewish house with a five-story house. Beautiful. If you look in the building, in the Queen Victoria building, that should give you an impression that the building was solid, ornate, and something pleasant to look at. But also they gave you the impression of a solid governmental empire, whatever. And people of the culture life were very active. <coughs> there were writers, there were poets, and business was thriving. People lived in harmony with each other. We also had a lot of people who came out into the world. Like, I don't know where anybody is in film, Otto Preminger. He was born in that place. There's a lot of other Edward G. Robinson. Anybody heard of Edward G. Robinson? He was born there too, and there were a lot of other people who made a mark in the world. There was one Joseph Schmidt who had the most wonderful voice, operatic singer. He started off in a choir, in a temple choir, but eventually was asked to come to Germany that he sang opera, and he had the most unfortunate end, because during the upheaval he tried to find a <coughs> refuge in Switzerland, but the Swiss would have loved him at first, didn't love him anymore. So he died there in a concentrate or a displaced person, or whatever it was. But at any rate, this is how a little bit of the power <coughs> regarding myself was. Europe has been divided to 1939, correct, 1939. If I miss some dates, forgive me. It was divided in two spheres, the Nazi sphere and the Russian sphere. So once each one took their share, they started to show who they are and how their occupation will be. <coughs> On the German side, they started having them already the Jews, killing them off if, wherever they could, put them in concentration camp. You didn't hear anything about it. The same applied also to Poles, because the Poles were considered undimensional, that means subhumans. So they were considered more like a slave power although they would have had more they would have had more claim to be the so-called racial pure, blonde, blue-eyed. All the Slavs are blonde and blue-eyed. Not the Germans. The Germans are mixed. They're very black. If you had a man like Gabriel, so you could think he was a cripple at the top of the town. But and then again, they were supposed to be human. Anyway, after the petition, we got numbered with the Russians. 
the Russian had the same idea of the isms. So you had Nazism and communism, you have a problem because they themselves weren't any better to the German. They had total disregard of you as a person. You were nothing but a number, a part of the empire. After a few months, while they occupied and people tried to get used to it, they had their own way of clearing the populace. Anybody who had a business, anybody who came from a rich family or a wealthy, but not necessarily too wealthy, but ordinary middle class people were considered as bourgeois. They had to be eliminated. There was only one way for them to do it, is to deport it to Siberia. As the time went on, we saw many of our friends, even some of my relatives were put on train. It didn't matter whether you're old or you're sick, you were lumbered onto a platform and onto a wagon. There were just as much, uh, there were no trains, proper trains, but they're just cattle wagons, which is empty on the inside. They gave you a pail for a toilet and some water, pail with water. And then off to Siberia. That could take you for weeks. But anyway, this was a good start. Many of our neighbors will walk up in the middle of the night, that's about, they like doing in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock, to work you up, pack as much as you can, off you go. With so many of our neighbors go, many of our relatives go. Our name was on the list, but we were lucky the war almost started. So 1941, the war actually started. After the first few weeks, once the German Romanian came in, the first thing that happened in Chernovich was a bloodbath in a Jewish quarter. Without mercy, people were murdered wherever they could. There were women were raped, places were looted, and also at the same time, that beautiful temple you see here, which stood over 200 years, was burned. They brought the chief rabbi, the cantor, and a lot of notables in it to watch how they defile the Torah scrolls. wonderful building that the cupola, the, the door, the tiles were so well done that any tile that exploded was like a gunshot. Then they took all these people, including a few other notables, up to another suburb where it was called the German suburb, and they murdered them, the dark mass graves. There's a lot of mass graves around there. But anyway, these were of our, that was in June, I think it was in June, because it was summertime. And they did not allow the people to be collected from the street when they got murdered, or the houses to be cleared up. That was staying for about two weeks, thinking somehow putrefied, and the same was enormous, but was something to be as an example to the rest of the populace. After that, they came through and collected the men or at least the thought capable men to put up another bridge. And my father was a monster. These people, many of these people never had a shovel in their hand or any other kind of instrument or implement. They never brought to the river. And they were kept there for the whole day, for a day and a half, where they were beaten. They were drowned. <coughs> And at the end of the day, as a thank you, every ten men was shot and they made another mass grave there. We were expecting our father. We didn't know. Everybody was trending because we had no idea where life is and where death comes. Eventually, he came in the middle of the night, I was again about two o'clock. I didn't recognize him. He's a beautiful man. But he must have gone through a lot of death. 
to see other people that people he knew. For what reason? Only because of that Jew. That was the only reason. He didn't rob anybody. He didn't beat anybody. He was a wonderful man. And from that moment on, things happened that we lost the citizenship. You lost any protection from law. Law didn't apply to you. So you had a lot of bands, gangs coming out from the suburb, beating people up. My own rabbi, who taught me, he was a beautiful man. They built his beard out. They burned him with cigarettes. They made all sorts of things. When he got home, he died soon after, because that's how bad he was being. For no other reason that he was a Jew. I couldn't go to school anymore. The schools were forbidden. So the only thing, but I was a lucky person, and a lot of people, even my age, were lucky, because at home, it was very important that you learn how to read and how to write, even before you went to school. This school where I went, that was like kindergarten or first school to learn Romanian. But in our home, German was the cultural piece. I could recite many poems by Schilling it. I used to be trotted out in front of grown-up people to say, come on, Fred, do your piece. You couldn't talk to the people, but you could be trotted out to say how good you are. And that's how I learned to read and write, really. But with regard to school, there was no <coughs> school. I think that was striking once again into the city was about Jews living in a country. Jew, uh, Jews actually did a lot of farming. They were farmers, ordinary farmers. So they couldn't say, well, you live of the riches, you live of usury and all that rubbish. They couldn't say it because people actually did farming. People in the cities were very cautious, they were very pious people, although they were modern and secular. They used to buy their products because they knew you get your milk from a kosher farmer, from a Jewish farmer, you get your meat from a Jewish farmer, you know it's kosher, because you accept that as being so. But it was almost like a free for all. Of all the villages that had Jews, all of them were murdered in the worst possible way, because they had something to do when they burned. There was impunity from law, there was no law, so they had a free hand to do whatever they liked. Men used to be, young men used to be asked to undress naked so they had their, their penises cut off and they had nearly written off the word of kosher. They did the same thing in Bucharest, they did a lot of these men, took them into the slaughterhouses, killed them, hung them up on books put the kosher sign and cut out the penis and put them in their mouths to say that they are kosher. And then they had their wives and women to come to collect them. But this was people who were your neighbors, people who were friendly with you, people who you never thought in a hundred years would say good to you. But one day you come in, you were helpful. During the day, there were curfews. The curfews were for three hours. Uh, you can only you could only have open to go to the market. You can only do for three hours. In that three hours, it was almost like a game, like we let the bulls loose. People were robbed and beaten up, but beaten up to death. For a few things. There was no money, so the only thing you could do was barter. Now. In about October, like everything else that happened, there would be more happening in a period of time when it was a Jewish holiday. I had my brother's sister, uh, mother-in-law said, she came from Berlin, and she said, the way you're keeping the way in the synagogue, the Gestapo came in today, come to the bank. All things that did happen were done in a day that they knew that it's a Jewish holiday. It didn't matter what. They knew exactly because most people would have disregarded everything around them to go to the, to the synagogue and, and to pray or whatever. But that was a time. And that's what they did. 
Shall I? In, well, it's in my store on the 11th of October. In about 5 o'clock in the morning, we were bashing in the door, get out and pack your things up, and go. That was the creation of the first ghetto. Now, what I try to do is to get a lot of people, like it were about still intact, about 40, between 40 and 50,000 people cramming into very, very tiny few, uh, a small quarter. People were lying but on top of each other. And that went on for a few weeks and already transports were taken to a place called Transnistria. Transnistria is an area that has been given to the Romanians by the Germans. And that is, the Nesta River is a demarcation border point between Romania and Ukraine. And the Romanians were given there an area called Transnistria. And they started piling people into the wagons to send them home. But then again, they realized diseases started to show up in amongst the people. It was typhus, meningitis, my brother, one of my brothers, by the way, I had three brothers and sisters, so I five siblings. And he, he, he could take the same guidance. The authorities were worried about the Jews, but they were worried about the rest, that they do not infect anybody else. So they decided to, uh, to allow some people to return to their home. Now, while I'm saying this, I would like to also mention there were a lot of wonderful Christian people. If you see my picture, the Bar Mitzvah was a Polish woman who took it. It was in a dangerous, very dangerous time for her. There were people who brought food to other people. It was funny thing that happened, which is sort of, if I say an, an anecdote, it's unbelievable. There was a, a German open car stopping in front of the house and a German officer coming out and knocking at the door. Not bashing, but knocking. So we were already dying because any time we had somebody like that at the door, you couldn't count on anything good except either being shot or me. And it comes to the door, and my father opens, and my brothers go and hide in the cellar, and we go another room to see what happened. And he says to my father, Mr. Weisinger, don't you recognize me? He said, no, I don't. He said, I work for you in Leipzig. Leipzig is a city in Germany which used to be a trade center for fur. And because he got every year there, my father, <coughs> He got to know people who were working in that field. So when that man came to the door, he brought food, and he said, as long as I'm here, because he was already a high officer, he said, as long as I'm here, do not fear, nothing will happen to you. But these were very few words of comfort, because he really didn't know from moment to moment what's happening to you. He was, he was sitting like on a hot plate. You didn't know where to stay. There was also a mayor of the city, a man named Trajan Popovich. He was a very Christian. He was really what I would call a Christian man. Because all of a sudden, he had to go to the generals who ever were in charge, and the governor, and say, look, if you're going to deport all these people, the city is going to be an empty city. We have no replacement. We need these people to handle and deal with the utilities because most of them are done by Jewish people. We need the people to look after the water reservoir. We need people to look after electricity. If you send a whole lot, you have nobody to replace them. So they started to issue uh, permits to stay. Of course, it was a big scramble, but Again, if you were fortunate enough, you got one. And with this way, they saved about 20,000 people from being deported. 
And I had to make a comparison to <coughs> Lodge in Holland, the one you heard of Schindler's List, where the same the people uh, in factories, so they can uh, so can work for Germany or whatever. But they saved them at least for a long period of time. We were almost the same situation because all of Europe was nothing but a channel house. It was just like a one big slaughterhouse. So if you had these few points here and there, it was really a miracle. It didn't matter how it happened, but it actually happened. And I read now an article where between Belgium and Holland, a place called Wimber, was a similar situation <coughs> where the Jews were saved through the intervention of the local people. So, at this time, you, we got also, because my father knew a lot of people in the, in the area, and he got also a personal stay. But it didn't save us altogether. You still lived a very precarious life every day because he didn't know what's happening. My two elder brothers had to go for service to work in a, in a, uh, a stone quarry in somewhere in, in Romania someplace. I haven't seen them for over 20 years because they didn't know what happened. The only thing we heard what happened is when the Russians came. They dynamited the whole uh, per perimeter of, uh, of the quarry. It was dynamited so, because everywhere they went, they wanted to wipe off what they did when the Russians came. Once Stalingrad went, Germany was already lost. They lost already in the first year. They had no provision. They assumed it's black Poland, but the Russians did not fall. And they really had to go a long way in the frost. It's 1942, one of the coldest winters in Europe. In a, if you are outside and not well dressed, you could freeze within a half hour. That's how badly it was. Now, the Russians came close to us. But in the meantime, I couldn't get out to play. I, because I was afraid. My parents were afraid. The people I went to school with, school friends, who used to come to my house, play with me. They caught me once, they beat me up very badly, so I had to go. I had to be in bed for a long time before my mother let me go out. So whatever it is, you can't go out, you have to play on the inside. And that went on. My parents wanted me to have a bar mitzvah, whatever that happened. So to get people at an assembly of 10 men, was a very dangerous thing, very, very dangerous. And people had to sort of move furtively around the streets to get into the house. It was, everything was done very quickly. And the Polish woman, I told you, lovely woman, she came and she dressed me up in sort of peasant gear so she could take me to her place and give me my clothes that she could take that picture of me in the public side. Most of my family that lived in the village were all murdered. Ugly, very ugly. I went with my brother in the 80s to have a look at my own town to see what it looks like. I was a young kid, everything was big. I was a grown man, everything became a bit smaller. We decided to go to the village. We didn't see any more the house. They had a huge farmhouse. What happened during the Russian period, they built a collective farm. They, they destroyed all the buildings. They built little huts or whatever. But it was a very funny thing. An old person came to us and he said, who are you looking for? And my brother was standing. It was a school that was built during the Austrian period, which my, father, my grandfather paid for. And he said, we're looking for bicycles. Ah, I knew the bicycles well. And he enumerated in Yiddish all my family and asked what happened. He said, I can't tell you very much because we weren't here when they got all murdered. Everyone is sundry got murdered. Women were raped dead because outside the Germans they didn't have any compunction with regards to violating Jewish people. There was no, there was 
no, no racial, uh, no racial uh, cleanliness or whatever they thought the Germans thought that they, were, they shouldn't touch any other race because they become contaminated. Now, 1944, right. as far as my brother, they didn't know what they like. I had my other brother, he had to work very hard in something that I have no idea of. Now the Russians came back. So once uh, Stalingrad was lost, everything took a bad turn for the Germans and the Romanians. Yet the killing machines never stopped. They didn't stop from murdering people. In transnistic people were left high and dry, no food, beatings, and once they sent you across the Bug River into Germany, you had no life. That was gone. You were really like a placing of them. Now that the Russian came back, most people who could <coughs> came back to their homes and were looted, burned. When they came back, they were the rest. But with the Russians, it was another thing. They had no consideration about the people who suffered whatsoever. To them, they were meaningless. What they did, they used to scour through camps, collect young men who were more or less healthy, and feed them and send them to the, the front. And many people died on the front. Germany or along the front. The other thing the Russians did, they had a very good memory. They knew a lot of people they did not send to Siberia. So one night, again, about three o'clock in the morning, knock, knock, knock. This survived me, yes, get rest. For two weeks we had no idea where he was. Because I was young, I could go and look for a police station, wherever he could be. <coughs> Eventually, I found him. He was there with other men. And they put him on a train to send him to Siberia. The war was still going on. The people have suffered a lot, but that was no consideration in the Russian army. So they sent him to a place past the Ural Mountains called Sverdlovsk and Chilabin. They were industries, the war industries of the Russian Empire. Somehow he got together with somebody else in the runoff. Into the trip from that area to home, these are told they were full with danger. They didn't know what happened to the other trip. But again, you go fight like from the frying pan into the fire. Romania at that time had a king, and also the Communist Party that was a little bit that size, all of a sudden became very big. And during the elections, they won. And already the curtain, the iron curtain started coming down. We were again on the run. So that time, we just had to cross to go to the west of Transylvania and they will stay for a while to sort of blend with the populace, cross the border, which means 40 kilometers walking at night. The borders were at the time still open, but extremely dangerous. People were, caught, were robbed, they were murdered, there was no police, no law, no, it was absolutely a risk at all time. We came to Debrecen. We hid in a, uh, that's my brother, my sister, myself, my parents stayed in the house. In Debrecen, we hid in a burned out synagogue in the community they started coming back from Auschwitz. They looked after us. They were stayed for a while in Budapest, then, and then we went on to Austria. But Austria at that time was also a very dangerous place because Austria was divided in four zones. You had the American, the French, and the Russian zone. <coughs> and if you 
by any chance got into the Russians or recognized you as a foreigner. They just kidnapped you and put you on a train back to Russia, not to where you came from. But after that, we went to, we had to cross again, clandestinely from Vienna onto Linz. I don't know the head of Linz. In Linz again, we, were, we started going to say the displaced person camp. And the one we stayed was a huge camp. It would have been about 12, 11 buildings of 100. They were built for the Nazi SS. The most beautiful building. Marble and parquet floors and for the guns in marble, beautiful marble. And that was given to the Jews as a, as a displaced person. And here again, I saw that we went through a horror time, but here we saw another, even greater horror, because two of these buildings were set aside exclusively for people who were brought out from the experimental camps of uh, Auschwitz and various other camps. Young people about my age. were horribly experimented on without any anesthetic. When nerves were cut, pieces were cut, they were burnt to everything was like an experiment to see how the soldiers would fare when they get burned or when they get chopped about. But to see that young people of my age at that time was not a horrible thing to see. They were ever taken to Switzerland because it was one of the few places where the medical services were still intact. And I couldn't believe, I mean, we already saw the inhumanity from man to man. But in the whole story of this, not once was any church coming out to say, we mustn't do that. In, in, in our town, we have the, the rock of uh, plundered. There was one church, a man came in wearing a kaftan, what do the Hasidic Jews wear? And they had a scrum, you know, the particular headgear. And he came into church on Sunday, and the priest knew it's not your gear. And he said, don't you ever come into church again dressed up like this. But he knew what's all about. Yet no word was said, no word was said. Listen to the words of Christ, don't do no other what you wouldn't want to have done to yourself. There was never that word, unfortunately. And after Linz, in Linz also I met people who were gay people who also were experimented in camps. What they did was gay people again. They either cut the scrotum off, assuming that they won't have any sexual feeling. The other thing was very well done was the lobotomy. Lobotomy is where they cut certain nerves off inside your brain, which sort of stifles your desires or whatever. But it was also young people, and that's incredible to see the array of people that had been worked on. And you think, is there God? Is there God to allow such cruelties? I would always think about reading Dante's Inferno. And I thought to myself, if Dante would live here, he would make up volumes of Inferno. <coughs> that was it was. Europe was an infernal place. But uh, still, we heard also that people who came back to their homes in many cases were murdered on the threshold. In Poland, where people stayed in a house, congregated in a house coming back, they were all burned to death. In a very slave in Austria, for example, they went out to protestation. Why did the Jews get milk? Who got? They forgot they lost the war. They still felt that they entitled to. In these sort of things you had all over Europe, there was no such thing of regrets. In fact, the denial was absolutely marvelous. You think the imagination of human beings to deny I could not do it. I didn't see it. My neighbors went, I thought they went on holiday. 
Papa, you see a whole row of people there with a backpack. Oh, I thought they were going on holiday to the works of and the camps or whatever. No, I didn't. Habe von nichts gewusst. That was the German way of saying. After Linz, I decided to, we went to a sort book, and at the time we wanted to leave uh, Europe because the curtain came <coughs> down. My parents made it to Budapest. The next day I would have seen them. They got arrested in sent back. They were all broke, but I had no choice. And during the Chargesque was they allowed them to go to Israel. I decided to go to Australia. Because I thought that Australia, looking at a map, it's an island with, a water, with water around it, had its own boat. I didn't think the thing would happen here. But was I surprised? Because Europe, America, and all these so called freedom countries, had very much racial programs. Even when I came to Australia in the 50s, I couldn't join the, the golf club in Rosebay. I wouldn't be the, the right person. I couldn't join any of the clubs because I wasn't the right religion. I mean, they dropped it after a while. The people were still had that animosity to go through because that's how it was. In America, you've seen it too, where they the always had the quarter system was stretched so that people couldn't even emigrate to the States. Yet the Nazis could go there without any, without any uh, problems. Thank you very much for this. I'm sorry if I bored you in some way, please forgive me. But this is my story, probably more to it. It's very, very hard to Condense a lot of things at one. The reality is, is it's way more wrong. And I don't wish to, for anybody at any time to go even through what I did. And I know that many people continue to show even worse than I did. Thank you very, very much. I 
Allah, even when the Japanese invaded of China, Shanghai was spared. You know, the Bund, where they lived most of the people, in that particular section was spared. But Europe, you had already the subcurrent of fascism, Nazism, nationalism. Already you had in the 30s, where in many countries, Jews got beaten up, and the recourse to law was very minimal. You shouldn't have gone there. You should. If you're the victim, you're the one at fault. But as time went on, and Hitler saw, I mean, when they had the Banzi, the Banzi conference at the time, it was already in the late, I think around 38 or 39, when he was already chancellor, they decided to do something about it. And that was the Juden Frage, the question of what you do with the Jews. We don't want it. Full stop. We don't want it. No country wants it. Britain had it at time, all the colonies in Africa. He had an idea to send them to Uganda. In Israel, they had the Mufti who was absolutely against it. And he was, in the British were very much encouraged to, to fight the Jews in the Israel. In the Struma, there was a ship called Struma, where a lot of Jews spent money to leave Romania to go to Israel, <coughs> would be Israel. That ship was a very good ship because you couldn't get any good ships. But what did they do? When they came to the Dardanelles that's outside Istanbul, they said, no, you can't, because the British didn't want you to let they were trying to save their lives. Their lives. They didn't go for conquest. They didn't go for a journey to save their lives. You come to my door and you die there. Beg me to open the door. Let me in. They did. So they signed the top with the, uh, with the Arabs. And they sent the boat back into the Black Sea. And it was torpedoed or whatever. It wasn't, it, nobody knows exactly what happened. Well, about over 400 passengers then had got drowned. There was nowhere to go. The only way to go was people who were deported to Siberia were lucky. In that way, they just stayed alive. Visible as the life of the people, they stayed alive. If many had a chance to go through Central Asia, like places Bukhara, and go into Iraq, in Iraq that was before the term, nasty like they're doing today. But basically, I met a lot of people. The other people who I know, Austria, for example, a lot of people from, uh, they had a few concentration camps in one of them, not house in another country. <coughs> and they allowed at that time to do the Jews. If you can go away and leave Austria, we'll let you go. <coughs> and some of them cost them a lot of money to get them on the boat. And they tried to go to again to Israel, but they didn't. So they were incarcerated in Mauritius. There was no way. This is what the moral of the whole story was once war ended, the Nazis had open go, they went to America. There was no visa restriction. South America is full of them. They went to all country without any the Vatican had to go through. It was an irony. Because none of the churches ever said that. It was always that big story to know. I had one incident here where I sat with a priest in train, I don't know how to come to He said, You don't talk to me, it's a pretty tough one. I said, I come from Europe, and what is it? Are you the Jewish? I said, Yes. I he said, Well, if the Jews would have believed in Jesus Christ, nothing <laughs> like this would happen. So I said, that's true. If they would have believed, nothing would happen. But again, if Jesus Christ would have come down on earth at that time, nothing would have been left of him. He'd be ashes in you destroy He said, no, Jesus wasn't a Jew. I said, just because one priest Antioch, 300 years, uh, 300 after his death, said, no, it's the Jews who killed Jesus Christ. 
The Jews who did it. It exonerated the Romans. I said, you know what had happened at that time? Do you ever read history? He said, oh, no, I know what it says in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell you that when he died, he died under Roman law. And like in any other country that occupies another country, you tell him that you're the king of the country. You want the baby. <laughs> and then he tried to be moved about it. It's all right, don't. I don't care. It really doesn't matter. But I wouldn't allow people to just get by the old days. That sort of excuse. It was a mass murder. A mass murder in the other part of it. Today, we're sort of heading into the same direction with the BDS. It, it frightened it frightens me to see how I do all the time I've got. But I look at universities in America. I write many times to say I always thought a university is a site of enlightenment, a learning, a site of the truth. I'll tell you, there's a big, bright future. And when I read now, bringing these hit their laws into the university. It's a frightening prospect. You know, on the ABC, you know that we had recently the story about uh, the minister here wanting to be bigotry to become Catholic. Uh, I wrote back and said you should read a BBC program which was created about the, the freedom to uh, the freedom of speech. Because you see, Every day, every time in the week, you read about Shia killing Sunni, Sunni killing Shia. If you don't realize it, it's done with something behind it. And if the BBC was a man, and I must admit, I admire for his ambassador, he should be dead by now. He should be in, in Britain, buy up all churches, and then store television equipment, for broadcasting, nobody sees anything on the outside. It's just a beautiful little village and a lovely little church. Nothing to tell you anything different. And the broadcast absolute <coughs> hate, unadulterated hate. And what they do, I don't know, they have something against Mohammed or whatever, but the, the language is nothing but hate. You hate the Sunni. The other one side say you hated the, the, uh, the uh, Shia. <coughs> then in that particular film, they show they have another segment where it goes to Egypt, and to one of these broadcast stations. And lo and behold, it's the same story. But then again, the broadcaster said, come with me to a city in, in, a, in Upper Egypt, and we see how I do the broadcast. And they show that he got actually lynched. Three people got murdered on that film. You know, I wrote to them, Brandon, and I wrote to him, I said, before you make any decision, just look in that film to see when bigotry comes in. Thanks, Fred. We have another question from Rachel. Yes. Thank you so much for your story. Um, I'm interested to know how your experiences, how, the, how that's shaped your faith, that particular belief in God that existed before, how these things have well, your faith. I have a motto. Did everyone hear the question? Yes. Yeah. I have a motto, Latin motto. I don't know how much Latin it is. It said, to me, we must be the last. Why do you live, enjoy life? To me, every day, life is a bond. I love life. I love life in all its facets. Faith. Because of my father, I have a faith. I may not be a religious person, but I have a funny feeling that it's something which guides our destiny, whether we like it or not. We do mistakes, we don't do mistakes, something that guides us. And that is my faith. I believe that every day is an improvement on the previous day. And I have no regrets. When I came to Australia, I couldn't speak the language. I couldn't speak. I got off the ship and went through customs in the Zambia. F, not a 
bloody father, so that something to that effect. But they're afraid of that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Again in the fifties and the late fifties, I met my doctor. Now he was German. I have hated him for <laughs> Because at first I didn't know he, I mean, I speak German fluently, almost perfectly. I speak what I live in, but I did not. So he had no way. He had a little bit and he said, You know, I hate Jews. I said, Why do you hate Jews? I met a Jew. He said, I don't go to say it. Because I like it. And he came to say it. And he said so for 38 years. And he was a marvelous person, very excellent, very humorous. And people loved him. He didn't particularly care for the day because he was afraid of my spread. But our house, we were the house together, was mainly filled with middle class. Jewish people from our double bay on this area. They loved him. He used to be able to crack jokes which basically friendly you woke out not for your years. But we had a wonderful life together. In the 38 years and he died a lot. But I think you can make it if you want to, if it's within you. You know, we want stability. I think that's the most important part in our life is stability. Love comes and goes, but stability stays. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, Do you want to stand, maybe? Hi. Thanks. Fred, I have a question. Uh, during the war, how did the Nazis uh, find out who was gay and who was not? How did they find uh, the pink tribe and all that? No. I think in various countries, how it would have. Germany. That the Nazis actually encouraged gaiety. Yeah, because don't forget, Berlin was the hub of the world. Berlin was absolute, uh, how should I put it? There's no comparison today to say, to give you a comparison. It was after the, after the crash in uh, where people, many men who couldn't, who had uh, good education, but couldn't get a job, they couldn't do math. They decided to become a gigolo. You've heard of a gigolo? 
A legal of means a guy who would go for money and have sex with other men only. They used to create at the time it was a craze in America, the dance hall craze, where you could hire a woman to dance with you, to pay, and the same thing applied in uh, in sorry, and the same thing applied in uh, in Germany. So it was part and parcel of German nightclub that had a, a lot of gay nightclubs in most of the large German cities. <coughs> In 1954, they came to Australia against from Hamburg, and they had there in what they called the Reppenbach, which was sort of the pleasure area of Hamburg. And there were bars, which were sort of left over from that particular period of time. They didn't function through the actual Nazi period, but prior to that, they did. And you had here, they were divided into two sections. One for men, one for men. Yeah. Being a new car, I didn't know about the rules. So I walked into the women's section, which I saw and said, you have to move into the other section. But then you realize it's a gay bar. Mm -hmm. And they had a few places like this. And another one they had a place where it was a bar where only the ladies could ask the men for a dance, not the other way around. I might still have some cards of that. <laughs> but gay was accepted universally up to the 30s. It was accepted. Uh, I met people from, uh, there was in the camp, and from Poland, a chap came a rich family. He was interned in the Theresa Stadt, another camp in Czechoslovakia. He, he said to me, too, we had a lot of gay friends, and I don't know. But once the Nazis put a boot into the war, that was it. So anything like that, because Rohm, I don't know if you heard, he was one of Hitler's generals. He was accused of being a homosexual. And because they had always these special camps where you, you know, it was called, uh, I remember in German, Licht Luft in Sonne, light, uh, fresh air, and the sun. It was really sort of, it generally was very much into physical culture. And I mean, like nudism and all that. They, everything went. But once the war started, and they cut down room, he was shot, or he shot himself, whatever, they stopped. Homosexuals, well, off. But they didn't, they didn't uh, pick up with lesbians. Lesbians were all right. That's a final thank you to each and every one of you for taking the time to join us today for this memorable and important gathering. I'm also reminded of the Hebrew phrase, Vahavta Lureacha Kamoka, love your neighbour as thyself. May we all strengthen our resolve to end hatred and may we all be agents for positive change so that we can say never again. This concludes today's gathering. Thank you.